Let's explore some economic terms and concepts that are important to the study of business organization law. First, let's talk about transaction costs. Now, transaction costs naturally are just the costs of doing a transaction, but we'll define transaction rather broadly to include not only discrete exchanges of goods and services, but long-term co contracts where parties need to work with each other. Like the business organization where parties are going to set up an entity and they're going to run a business for a long period of time. Now, the thing about transaction costs is that we can often say that one transaction cost will belong to one of the parties, but that party who bears the transaction cost will share the cost of the transaction with the other party. So when we have a transaction cost, it's really a cost to the transaction that both parties will share. So it behooves the parties to reduce the transaction cost. Here's an example. Uh, imagine I want to sell my house and I engage a real estate agent to help me sell my house. That is a transaction cost. The real estate agent is going to cost me 6% uh, or 5% depends uh, on the transaction and the house and where you are. But I'm going to have to pay the real estate agent a commission to sell my house. That is my transaction cost, right? I'm the seller. Now, you enter into contract to buy the house from me you have actually shared that transaction cost with me. Why? Because I have priced the house high enough to compensate me for the, the cost of paying the real estate agent commission. And through my adjusting of the price, you will bear some of the cost. The buyer will bear some of the cost, will share some of the cost of paying the real estate agent's fee or commission. In our course, we're going to focus mainly on agency costs and information costs. What are agency costs? Well, agency costs arise when we have an agency problem where a principal gives authority or discretion to an agent to run a transaction or to operate a business on behalf of the principal. What is the principal worried about? The principal is worried that the agent will not do her job carefully and that the agent will not do her job honestly, that she will steal from the principal, that she will benefit herself at the expense of the principal. What are the transaction costs in this transaction, in this relationship? Well, we're gonna have monitoring costs, we're gonna have bonding costs, and we're gonna have the costs of residual losses. We'll explore these in greater detail in the next slide. Our other category of transaction costs is our information costs. Information costs are just the uh, costs of acquiring the information that you need to engage in the transaction or if you cannot find the information you want. It is the price adjustment you're gonna make to compensate you for that risk. Let's just give a couple examples. Imagine I want to buy a piece of property that I plan to use for a specific use. You are selling a piece of property. Can I use that property? Is that property zoned for the use that I want? Well, I have to do some research to find out, and uh, that research will cost me. Now, some of you might say, well, I can do that research on my own, but there's a cost to that. There's the time of doing that research, and there's the cost of your education that allows you to do that research. You can do that research because you've been through law school and you've taken property law. And so you've invested time and money to acquire that skill so that you can do that research. That is a cost. Um, let's uh, look at another example. Um, imagine I want to buy a used car. 
Think of the information costs that I have. I want to make sure that this car will last me a certain period of time and not have large maintenance costs, large maintenance and repair costs. You're selling a used car. How do I know that this car meets my expectations, right? There's not a lot of research I can do to determine what's going to happen in the future. I can get a mechanic and I can pay for a mechanic to look at the car, but I still bear a certain amount of risk. Anytime a party has risk in a transaction, they will use pricing to compensate themselves for that risk. So if there is a great risk that this car will break down, I might not enter into the transaction or I might enter into the transaction, but I will be willing to pay, excuse me, but I will be willing to pay a lower price for the car. The lower price includes a premium that I charge you for the risk that this car will break down. Those are information costs. Let's talk about agency costs in a little bit greater detail. Remember what the agency problem is. The agency problem is, is that when we have a principal who gives discretion or authority to an agent to do something on her behalf, the principal is concerned that the agent will do her job diligently and honestly. Uh, in this relationship, this agency relationship, uh, there are three categories of transaction costs. Monitoring costs, bonding costs, and the costs of residual losses. First, let's talk about monitoring costs. These are the costs that the uh, principal incurs to monitor the agent, to make sure that the agent is working diligently and honestly. Right? Sometimes you walk into a store and you see security cameras. Now, those are security cameras, but they are often also used to monitor the agents, to make sure that the agents are working carefully and to make sure that the agents are not stealing from the store. The next category of transaction, excuse me, of agency costs are called bonding costs. Imagine that you are the most diligent and most honest agent in the history of agents. How do you convey this to the principal so that the principal can reduce her monitoring costs? I am an honest agent and therefore you do not have to monitor me. Well, there are a couple ways. I can actually get an insurance bond. And the idea is that if I steal from you, the insurance company will compensate you, right? But getting a bond has its cost. I have to pay a premium to the insurance company for the bond. Uh, another type of bonding is if the agent takes incentive compensation. So the principal is concerned that the agent will not work diligently, and that's because their incentives are not aligned. The principal wants the agent to work very, very diligently, and the agent would prefer to relax and take her time and take a vacation, right? How do we align the incentives? Well, if the agent takes incentive compensation, the, incent the agent says, listen, I will take as my compensation a percentage of the profits. And now the agent has the incentives to maximize the profits and her incentives are aligned with the principal who also wants maximum profits, right? And that is a form of bonding. By taking incentive compensation, the agent is saying to the principal, you do not have to monitor me for diligence. The incentive compensation takes care of that. I will work diligently to maximize profits because I get paid a percentage of the profits. The final category of agency costs are the cost of residual losses. So no matter how much monitoring the principal does or how much the agent uh, invests 
in bonding, there are going to be times where the agent shirks and costs money to the principal. Right? There, no matter how much monitoring the principal does, there are going to be times where the agent shirks, where the agent does not act diligently and where the agent does not act honestly. These are costs, and we call these costs residual losses. All right, let's talk about the crowds. And what I mean by the crowds is how having a large group of people changes the dynamic and changes the incentives for any one person to act. All right, let's talk about the free rider problem and the collective action problem. These two issues, these two problems are key, are crucial to understanding a lot of the issues in uh, business organization law. So the free rider problem is where we have a public good and one party bears the cost of that public good, but the others benefit. This creates a disincentive for that party to act. So let's think of some concrete examples. Imagine you live in a house and you have several roommates and naturally you all share the kitchen and you all share the microwave. Now, we all know when there is a shared microwave, that microwave gets dirty fast and it stays dirty and it can get quite disgusting. Why doesn't anyone clean the microwave? Well, first, we have a public good, right? And the public good in this case is a clean microwave. Everyone uh, benefits, everyone in the house benefits from a clean microwave oven. Why doesn't one person clean it? Well, if one person cleans it, that person is bearing the cost of cleaning the microwave oven. And if you've ever cleaned a discussing microwave oven, you know that the costs are very high. So that one person bears all the costs of that public good, a clean microwave oven, but the others benefit from it. This creates a disincentive for any one person to bear the cost of cleaning the microwave. Um, let's talk about another situation that involves roommates. Imagine you live in a, a house and you have a lot of roommates and you uh, want to buy a TV for the living room. Now, the living room is a space that everyone will use. So if you put a TV in there, it will be a public good. And therefore, you have a disincentive to buy a TV for the living room because you will bear all of the costs, but everyone else will benefit. Now, if you feel that your use of the TV will exceed everyone else's use, then your disincentive to buy the TV has been somewhat mitigated, right? You will still have a somewhat of a disincentive to buy the TV, but because you will spend more time watching the TV than everyone else, you are capturing more of the benefit of the public good. Uh, let's talk about another situation. Imagine you are a citizen of a town of about 50,000 people, and this town, of course, has a government. Are you monitoring the government to make sure that they are doing their job correctly and they are not corrupt? Well, think about it. Why don't you do this? Monitoring the government would have costs for you. It, these information costs, it's time, it's money. And if you discover that the local government is not doing its job or that they're corrupt, everyone will benefit from it. And therefore, you have a disincentive to engage in the monitoring of the local government. Those are uh, the transaction costs associated with a free rider problem. Let's talk about the collective action problem, which is closely related to the free rider problem. When there are numerous parties, 
there are difficulties in getting the parties to cooperate, right? Difficulties will translate as high costs. So let's return to the situation where you're going to buy a TV for the common living room, right? If you only have two roommates, you can address those uh, free rider problems by asking your roommates to chip in. There are low costs of cooperation here because you only have two roommates. Uh, let's think of a, another free rider problem and talk about how the collective action problem is related to it. Imagine that you are uh, in a college or law school course and the professor gives a team project and you're going to get a team grade. Now, the team grade is a public good. Everybody on the team will benefit from that grade. To the extent that you feel that you are bearing more of the cost to achieve a good grade, you have a disincentive to put in extra work, right? That is the free rider problem. You think the others are free riding on your efforts. Now, if you have a small team with people you trust, then the collective action costs are not that high, right? You can monitor your other team members to make sure that they are putting forth an equal or relatively equal effort. If the team is rather large, 15 to 20 people, the, collect, the collective action problem will exacerbate the free rider problem. Let's continue talking about the crowds and the issues related to the crowds. These issues are most acute in the public stock market and in public companies. Remember what we said a public company is. It is just a business organization, usually a corporation, whose stock is traded publicly on a stock market like NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. Some examples, famous examples, Disney, Microsoft, Google, uh, GE, P&G, all of these companies, their stock is publicly traded on a stock market like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. All right, let's talk about diversification of investment and dispersed ownership. First, diversification of investment. Diversification of investment is an investment strategy that reduces risk for an investor. Imagine I have $100,000 and I want to invest this in the stock market. Will I invest this all in one company? Well, you probably can spot that that's not a good idea. If I invest my entire $100,000 by buying stock in one company, if that, stump, if that company performs poorly or goes bankrupt, I lose my money. So I am at greater risk. Diversification of investment is essentially a strategy where you don't put all of your eggs in one basket. So instead of taking my $100,000 and investing it in one public company, I will take $10,000 and invest it in 10 public companies. In that case, uh, if one of the companies goes bankrupt, I don't lose a significant proportion of my investment. Now, I am not the only investor in the stock market that engages in this strategy. Virtually every investor in the stock market engages in this strategy. All right, let's talk about dispersed ownership. Dispersed ownership is uh, largely a product of diversification of investment. So if I am a public company like Disney, Microsoft, or Google, and I need large amounts of capital and I sell stock to raise capital, if investors in the stock market are engaged in diversification of investment, they are not investing a large proportion of their money in any one public company. And that means I am going to have a large number of small investors, 
right? No one investor is going to hold a significant proportion of my total stock that is outstanding. And this is called dispersed ownership. Now, dispersed ownership will necessarily result in a free rider problem and a collective action problem. How does that work? Well, remember, we have the agency costs of a public company. We have a management team that is running the business of the company for the benefit of the shareholders, for the benefit of the owners who are dispersed owners the owners will want to monitor the management team to make sure that the management team is acting diligently and honestly. But no one shareholder has a large significant shareholding in the company and therefore has disincentives to monitor the management. This is just another application of the free rider problem. If I'm an investor in the public company and I monitor the company, I monitor the management to make sure they are doing their jobs diligently and honestly, this is a public good. It benefits all of the shareholders, but I bear all of the costs. So I have a disincentive to do that type of monitoring. Uh, once again, this is due to the collective action problem, we have a large number of shareholders and altogether we have significant investment in this public company. And because we have such a significant in this investment in this public company, we have collectively an incentive to monitor the management. But because we have a collective uh, action problem, there are thousands and thousands of shareholders. There is a high cost of us cooperating. There's a high cost of us communicating and acting together as one group. All right, continuing talking about the crowds. Now, we just talked about public companies and public, uh, the public stock market. Who are the investors in the public stock market? Well, we have investors like me and you, individual investors who are also called retail investors. Depending on what statistics you look at, individual and retail investors only make up about 25% of the investment in public companies. There are also controlling shareholders and institutional investors who invest in public companies. Now, controlling shareholders are shareholders that hold a large uh, percentage of the shares of any one public company. Usually, not always, but usually they are the entrepreneurs who set up the company. They're the early founders of the company who then built the company and eventually took it public. When the company goes public, they maintain a large percentage of the outstanding stock. And so uh, they are the controlling shareholders who hold a large controlling interest in the company. Then we have institutional investors. We have mutual funds, insurance companies, public retirement funds, and hedge funds that all invest in the stock market. Let's just look at insurance companies as an example. You get insurance on your house. You pay that insurance company a premium. What does the insurance company do with that premium? Well, they want to make money off of that premium. So they invested it in various different investments. One of those investments is the public stock market. So they will invest in public companies. Um, mutual funds. Mutual funds are a way for an individual investor like me to get diversification of investment. Now, the original uh, hypothetical I had for diversification of investment was that I had $100,000 to invest. And so to diversify my investment, I invest $10,000 in 10 different public companies. But what if I don't have $100,000? I just have $1,000. Am I going to buy $10 worth of stock in 100 companies, that would not be very efficient. And the fees for buying and selling that stock are about $8 a trade. So that would just cost me almost as much for the trading fees as it would the uh, capital that I have to invest. 
So what I can do is I can take that investment and invest it in a mutual fund. And the strategy of the mutual fund is that the mutual fund now goes out and invests in various different public companies. So the mutual fund is a diverse investor. It has a large portfolio of investments, let's say public companies that it invests in. And I, the retail investor, I invest in the mutual fund and I gain the benefit of the mutual funds diversification of investment. Public retirement funds. There are some states that have uh, retirement systems and they make contributions to these retirement systems and they need to make money off of those contributions. And so they take those contributions and they invest them. One of the investments that these public retirement funds engage in is the investment in public companies. And finally, we have hedge funds. Hedge funds, you can think of them as mutual funds for very rich people, but hedge funds might invest in public companies. If they do, usually they're, they're taking a large stake in a public company and they want to change the management somehow. Um, hedge funds have different investment strategies. They are private, so it's not like an, uh, an individual investor like me or other retail investors can invest in a hedge funds. They're private funds and you can only invest in them by knowing someone. So for example, the Bernie Madoff fund, that was a hedge fund and you only got to invest in that hedge fund if you had some sort of connection to Bernie Madoff. And thankfully, uh, I did not and you did not. All right, now let's talk about the general issues we see in business organizations, the general conflicts we see. Uh, the conflicts we see stem from the private benefits of control or opportunism. Uh, in our context, we can use these terms interchangeably. Opportunism just means taking advantage of someone, and usually you can take advantage of someone by benefiting yourself at their expense, and you can do that only because you have a certain amount of control. And so private benefits of control and opportunism are largely interchangeable terms. Now let's put them in context. Remember, we have a business organization and we have owners or residual claimants, and we have, often we have uh, management or agents who are running that uh, business organization on behalf of the owners or residual claimants. Because the management and agents have control, they might use that control to benefit themselves at the expense of the residual claimants. This is the private benefits of control or this is opportunism. What will they do? Well, they might just goof off, right? Or they might actually somehow steal from the company. These are the private benefits of control. Now, we might also have private benefits of control when we don't have management and agents running the company, but we do have a large owner, a controlling owner. And usually it's a, a public corporation, so we say a controlling shareholder, but it might not be a public corporation. We might have a controlling shareholder in a small private company or a closely held business. When you have a controlling shareholder, the controlling shareholder has control. And therefore, she might use this control to benefit herself at the expense of the other shareholders, the other residual claimants. This is another example of the private benefits of control or opportunism. All right, finally, let's talk about solutions to these issues. Now, we have transaction costs. The transaction costs are the issues. And we wanna see how the law uh, solves these or addresses these transaction costs. And we wanna see how private ordering addresses these transaction costs. Remember our transaction costs. We have information costs, we have the free rider problem, we have collective action problems, we have agency costs, and we have the related issues of private benefits of control and opportunism. 
Throughout the course, we'll look and see how the law addresses these transaction costs. But more importantly, we're going to be lawyers, and lawyers are effectively transaction cost engineers. If you are looking to be on the litigation side of the law, then effectively you are dealing with your, tri your client's transaction costs post hoc, after the fact, after something has occurred, you are now litigating in court and you're trying to reduce the costs of this problem for your client. If you are a transactional attorney, you are helping your client engage in what we call private ordering. And this is how we use contract. This is how we structure the transaction to reduce transaction costs and protect our clients. Uh, effectively, a transactional lawyer helps the client engage in private ordering. We'll discuss various different strategies, various different private ordering mechanisms throughout the course that you can use to reduce transaction costs for your client in the context of business organizations.